Merci beaucoup, Florence. Merci. Thank you very much, Florence. Thank you, Giacomo. My name is Daniel Bouchard. I am the here for as an honor to go live from the Faculty of uh, Social Sciences on the campuses of University of Ottawa, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the numerous attendees here at the uh, Faculty of Social Sciences and also those following us online and uh, my co-host, Wendy. Hello, how are you? English, but uh, I'm going to try and follow along which, uh, with what everyone is saying. So it's really wonderful to be here for the ninth annual public meeting of CBC Radio Canada. And it's nice to see everyone who's turned out. We really appreciate it. When I'm anchoring the news at night, I always imagine that there's people watching. So it's nice to actually see real faces. It's kind hey. of a freaky experience. Exactly. <laughs> Indeed. So it will be a wonderful experience. And obviously, today's debate, and it will be a fully fleshed uh, debate. Uh, and uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions, and the, our journalists will respond. Often, you know, we're talking a lot today about alternative facts and fake news, and the world is in flux. So, what is the role of journalism, generally speaking, and that of the media? And more specifically speaking, what is the role of the public broadcaster? Radio Canada CBC. So we'll be able to follow that very closely, but also remotely by writing to us at our uh, electronic address, email, and also on Twitter. So we ask ourselves all kinds of questions all the time in this era of fake news. It's been a really rough year, but today is going to be your chance to ask us some of those questions, and uh, we'll try our very best to answer them, not us personally, mm -hmm. uh, mostly with our, our colleagues who we'll, we will introduce you to in just a moment. But to kick off, as is customary, we would like to invite Elder Claudette Commando. She is an Algonquin, Anishinaabe, and also an elder in residence here at the University of Ottawa to do an opening prayer and to welcome you here on the unceded lands of the Algonquin people. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Pijaji Goma Anishinaabe Aki Omama Wenenewag. Bevenu Tulmon Isi Welcome, everyone, to the ancestral lands of my Algonquin peoples. And every one of you. As customary in our traditions, Anytime we gather, we always begin our gatherings in a good way. And that good way is to honor creation and to give thanks and open in prayer. So I say to the Creator, on behalf of everyone who's here, I say to him, Gijimanado, Kichimigwej, Onje Nogum, Daspinigen, Nijenwen Daganag, Daspinigen Kokumasag, Daspinigen Mishomsag, Nibuksendam Keabaj Kijigun, Onje Kakina, Nibuksendam Mashkawiziwin, we give great thanks to the Creator for life, Minopamadzwin. We ask the Creator to bless this beautiful meeting. Bless this meeting, this annual general meeting, and the work that you do at CBC. You do your work in a good, kind way, and that the Creator blesses you with many more tomorrows. We thank the Creator for our Mother of the Earth, our Grandmother of the Moon, our Grandfather of the Sun. We thank Creator for the land and for all the people. We ask Creator to bless us with his goodness, his kindness, and his love. And to each and every one of you know that you carry that sacred gift, the sacred gift of life. And we do so in kindness and respect, to respect one another as brothers and sisters in this human family. Miigwech, merci beaucoup, thank you. Thank you so much for welcoming us. Alors maintenant, j'aimerais inviter... Now I'd like to invite two people who were kind enough to welcome us here on the campus of the University of Ottawa, the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, Mr. Marcel Meret, as well as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Mr. Kevin Key. Bonjour, tout le monde, bon après. Welcome everyone. Alors, euh, fidèle à sa tradition, la faculté des sciences. La tradition. Faithful to our tradition. Hein? 
So it is our opportunity to be engaged. Especially pleased to, being, to be hosting uh, the CBC Radio Canada community today. So let me take this opportunity to make sure that you know that in this particular space, in this building, our social science students, our researchers, and our professors, they all strive to build knowledge and exchange ideas on how our society could be improved and reimagined. So as such, I like to think that what we are doing with respect to training, teaching, and research is somewhat complementing what such an organization like CBC Radio Canada is trying to achieve. In effect, our professors... Indeed, our professors are informing the Canadian public by sharing their knowledge in the classrooms, in uh, publishing of, uh, of uh, academic journals and also in the media. And we know as journalists you have an extremely important role, a responsibility to show the Canadian public the facts and the truth. And it is this work that helps to feed public opinion and sustain democracy for the social and moral conscience of our society. So I'm very pleased to call my friend the Dean of the Faculty of the Arts to the stage to elaborate on our common work and undertakings. Thank you, Dean Merhet. À mon tour, j'aimerais... It's now my turn to welcome uh, colleagues from CBC Radio-Canada as part of the annual public meeting. I'm very excited to be participating in this exciting discussion on the world of the news and information, and specifically our public broadcaster. Better to discuss the issue of fake news and broadcasting. Questions about credibility, media, and the future of public broadcasting lie at the heart of research and teaching in the Faculty of Arts, especially within our Department of Communications, and particularly within our digital journalism program. And I'm delighted to see so many of our students and professors here today testimony to our interest in these questions. I am sure that today's event will be a source of inspiration for our students, for our researchers, and for the entire academic and university community. So I'd like to join with my colleague, Dean Meret, to once again welcome you and uh, wish you a fruitful discussions. Without filters. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to call on Rémi Racine, who is the uh, chairman of the board of CBC Radio-Canada. Rémi. Merci. Alors, messieurs les doyens, uh... Dean Meret and Dean Key, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of CBC Radio-Canada, thank you for having us here on your campus. We're so happy that you've given us this space and opportunity to meet with you. I enjoy speaking in public to young people and not so young people. It's something I do almost every day. Today, though, is a special opportunity for me and my colleagues on the board of directors to listen to what you have to say about the future of public broadcasting in Canada. I have no doubt that our conversations will be inspiring. I approach the end of my term, and it's the second year I say that, I'm very proud of the fact that CBC Radio Canada is much, much more agile organization than before, an organization that thrives on innovation, collaboration, and partnerships. With lighter infrastructures and better process, we have gained a stronger focus on what matters the most, making great content that connects, reflects, and engages with you. Content such as the number one English-Canadian drama and comedy in the country, Murder Mysteries and Kim Convenience, and the highly anticipated miniseries Alias Grace, based on a novel by Margaret Artwood. 
À Radio-Canada, les nouveaux épisodes des séries que vous aimez comme... Radio-Canada will keep you on the edge of your seat this fall with the return of popular shows like Mémoire Vive and Unité Neuve. Suspense was also high for the season's premiere of District 31. 1.4 million Canadians sat down to watch that first episode and find out what had happened to Lieutenant Nadine Legrand. Because of the work we've been doing, we are also attracting some of the most creative, innovative and energetic talent in the country, and you can see it on our platforms every day. Soon, I'll go back to be like you and the audience, simply enjoying quality entertainment and news programming. My friends, I believe in our future, our future look very good. Let me introduce our president and CEO, Hubert Lacroix. Hubert. Thank you, Rémi. Thank you, Rémi. Doyen Meret, Faculty of the Social Sciences. Welcome to everybody. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our annual public meeting. I like the feeling of university campuses and always have, particularly in the fall. It goes back to the times when I was a sessional lecturer in law school and a university women's basketball coach. September meant new students, new players, new energy, assignments in the beginning of the various varsity athletic programs. I envy you. Have fun. Envy. I envy you and have fun. PM. Notre Assemblée publique annuelle, comme le disait Rémi, est un environnement privé. This yearly gathering is a privileged setting for us to engage with you about the role we play and our goal of staying at the centre of Canadians' conversations. To hearing your thoughts on our programs, on our digital initiatives, and on your expectations of us and how we can be even better at meeting them. I've been at the helm of CBC Radio-Canada for nearly 10 years now and my term ends on December 31st. So I'll hope you'll indulge me as I briefly run down a few things to put these last few years in perspective. There was actually no iPad, no Netflix, no Vice, no Snapchat, no Spotify, no Instagram, no Amazon. Actually, not in the way that we know them now. And only 9% of Canadians actually had a smartphone. Now we are more than 70% using them. And our digital journey at CBC Radio-Canada has been audacious, innovative, bold, and difficult. But it has turned CBC Radio-Canada, an 80-year-old corporation, built around and known for its radio and television programs into what it is today, the number one digital media company in Canada. And we did this in spite of serious financial challenges, a fragmented ecosystem, the appearance of the Googles, Facebooks, and Netflixes of the world, who have absolutely weakened the broadcasting model that used to support our industry. Et tout au long de cette transformation, and throughout this incredible transformation, we stayed true to and strengthened our mandate to Canadians. We put local at the centre of our 2020 plan, our five-year strategic plan launched in 2014. We created eight new multimedia stations in communities across the country and strengthened our regional coverage to seven days per week, 18 hours per day, from good morning to good night. So we are now a real, complete local media outlet. 18 million unique visits each month by 2020. Well, we surpassed that goal this summer, two and a half years ahead of schedule. And that 18 million number does not include our two million followers on Facebook and Twitter. CBC News is now the number one Canadian news app 
with more than 3.9 million downloads. We lead in podcasting with more than, the number is staggering, 200 million downloads since 2016. And the popular investigative podcast series, Somebody Knows Something, has actually by itself been downloaded more than 30 million times. Les émissions d'ICI2 TV sont regardées. ICI2 TV programs are streamed more than 6.4 million times each month. RAD, our recently formed lab with Radio Canada, where we aim at reinventing the way we deliver news and current affairs on social media to digital citizens, is already producing compelling content with 15 reporters and digital savvy content and user experience designers and with no one over 35 years old in that unit. Go see their stuff on Facebook to their own car, meaning they run this project. So I'd encourage you to go and see what they're doing on the web. We also created CBC News Indigenous and Espace Autochtone at Radio Canada and are hugely successful web portals dedicated to Indigenous stories. We are clearly today a leading broadcaster, a leading public broadcaster in the digital world. And in an era of fake news, we are proud to remain the most trusted Canadian source for news and information. Cette confiance est grande. That trust is in large part because of the continuous work of our incredibly talented journalists. And I'm delighted that some of them are here with us today to share their experiences with you. Et si nous connaissons un tel succès, Clearly, we were only able to achieve these results because of our CBCers, because of their commitment to public broadcasting, because of their creativity, their vision, and their resilience. Today, as I'm about to exit, I want to say a very profound and very loud thank you to all the people who work at CBC Radio-Canada and to my senior executive team for having committed to this transformation, to this incredible digital transformation, and having spectacularly delivered on it. I also say thank you, I will also say thank you to all of our board members for the time that you guys invested in the public service and in the public broadcaster. Ainsi qu'à Rémi, qui a... As well as Rémi, that has been our chairman of the board for the past five years. Manchester is actually a pretty cool place to work at right now. We aim to attract some of the best and the brightest this country has to offer. And we're doing this as we reinvent ourselves. Over the last two years, we've hired nearly 250 people to support our digital initiatives and we have retrained 2,900 of our own CBCers and Radio Canadien because there is absolutely no finish line to this transformation. And we continue to do all this, but we're And we can uh, doing this with an unwavering focus on diversity and inclusion. Our vision is clear. We want a range of faces, voices, experiences, and perspectives in both our content and our workforce so that we reflect our country in everything we do. I hope that someday some of you will join us, some of you who are with us here today. In the meantime, I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts and answering your questions. Thank you. Alors, merci, uh, beaucoup. So, thank you so much, Hubert. And as Hubert just pointed out, in a little bit, uh, we'll be introducing journalists, our colleagues, who will answer your questions. And we are live on Facebook, 
and responses can be given online, on Facebook, on Twitter. We've also got our email address. And I'd remind you that uh, you can also ask questions directly from the room. Giacomo and Laurence, just to uh, draw your attention to yourself, and then you can ask questions in the microphone. So I'll remind you that today's theme is No Filters, Truth, the Media Platforms, the Future of Public Broadcaster. We'll be speaking about this. It's a time when we talk a lot about uh, alternative facts and fake news. What are the tools? What is the knowledge and know-how that we have in order to distinguish truth from lies? about to depart president, talk about uh, mm -hmm. the old days. And I, when I was in university, everyone, it was the age of Watergate. Yeah, I'm that old. Um, and everybody looked up to journalists as these great heroes, where as now we're in an age where the president of the United States is calling us fake news. So things have changed so much. We have so much to talk about. And I'm really thrilled right now to introduce, we have six journalists here with us from CBC Radio Canada, and we're going to ask them to come out now to talk about credibility, public value, democracy, all the big stuff. So first up, we have Chelsea Agro. She's a journalist and host of Marketplace CBC. Hi, Chelsea. Mesdames et messieurs, accueillons comme il se voit. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Olivier Abomas, a journalist at the Red Project, journalist laboratory Radio Canada. Christian Latrelle, who's a Washington correspondent for Radio Canada TV. Melissa Francois. Radio Canada journalist and working on the uh, Réseau d'Information News Network. And my colleague Mathieu Nadon, who is an anchor of Telejournal Ottawa Gatineau weekdays. He's a reporter and editor for the Ontario regions with CBC News. Hey, well. So now let's kick off our discussion. Let's sit. First theme chosen, there'll be three. First theme, credibility. I'm going to ask my question of a colleague who works in this uh, news lab. He has been uh, plunged into this new universe. I'd like his to, Tim to tell us about the new ways of doing things, of, uh, in fact, attracting folks' attention on their smartphones. How do you in fact, get the attention of people on smartphones. Well, we were speaking about this just a moment ago, in fact. There is a huge flow of information. It's hard to distinguish what is real news and what is fake news. And Radio Canada CBC needs to remain a benchmark for reliable news, as we've always been. In addition to this, and we spoke about this earlier, beyond the whole notion of fake news, that is uh, partial news or completely invented news, there's the whole label of fake news, uh, which we, some people attribute to uh, traditional uh, media outlets to undermine their credibility. We've seen Trump do this on Facebook and Twitter. Um, you know, Radio Canada is fake news. And what d does that demonstrate? It uh, smacks of a crisis of confidence in traditional legacy media, but also a misconception of how media actually works, which is often perceived as something rather uh, a foggy concept uh, and, uh, and the evil forces are at its helm. So what we're trying to do is to be more transparent in the way we go about things as journalists and to show what we're doing behind the scenes, why we're talking about a particular topic, about a particular person, why we're employing a particular uh, way of speaking. And RAD is this new Radio Canada project. Where, so we're trying to lift the veil on the what's happening behind the scenes in media outlets to increase the confidence. Come to you, uh, Yubara was talking about how we're so trusted and people are coming to us on digital, but it's been a rough year for everybody in, in the media. Um, so what sort of challenges have you faced? How do you get around them? Uh, how, how do you, how do we win the trust of, uh, of an audience? 
Well, I think at this stage in the game, uh, CBC's reputation is all it has, really. And uh, in an increasingly digital realm where basically anybody can put out any sort of information, uh, any sort of headline or image can go viral. Uh, so that's what we're competing with, whether we like it or not. And I think it's incumbent upon us as the traditional and also newer independent media uh, to help people discern between what's fake and what's real. And I think there are some really easy ways that you can do that. Um, first and foremost is check the source. Is it a trusted traditional source or is it a tr trusted independent source? Um, can you look at that website or that host and see that it is in fact uh, a regular news website? And also I, I like to encourage people to actually click on the article and read it rather than just sharing the crazy viral <laughs> headline or crazy viral picture because once you start reading the article um, you'll see that if it's a credible story there will be actual people quoted, there will be actual people attributed and that will help you really get a fuller picture of what it an issue is, and I think it. Once you start um, engaging in those own practi practices on your own as a news media consumer, you'll be able to tell pretty easily what's real and what's fake. Thank you. We have a question now uh, from the floor, Giacomo. Actually, this one comes from the World Wide Web, and it's for Wob. <laughs> and it's we've heard of that. Yes. How do you vet anonymous sources and ensure that you're able to verify your facts and protect your sources, Wob? Ooh, that's a that's a really great question. Um, it, yeah, it's you know your sources are the your lifeline, your lifeblood to your stories, especially if you're trying to do original journalism. Um, I think once you get that information. Uh, and you're armed with that and you can go to the you know, positions of power and the people who are accountable uh, in order to sort of present that to them and, and verify whether that's actually a story or not. Uh, and how nervous they get will sort of indicate you know, how much of a barn burner that particular story is. So, um, but those are discussions that we have on a daily basis with our assignment producers, uh, with our you know, senior producers, our managing editors, about how we proceed with stories like that. And we're very cautious about it and we want to do it in a good and proper way and I think that's one of the core cornerstones of CBC journalism, and I think that's what sets us apart from a lot of other these fake news uh, organizations. Merci beaucoup, Wag. On se bouscule aux portes en termes. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to jump around with questions, and we've got a lot of questions uh, online. Uh, from Ontario, for Christine Latré, can a public broadcaster engage in independent journalism? That's perhaps a question for Christian. I think indeed it can, and I think Radio Canada CBC is the best example of the most independent media outlet uh, in Canada. And I think that what helps us a lot in CBC Radio Canada is that we're guided by journalistic uh, standards and practices, which isn't normally the case. Uh, we are monitored by the ombudsman. We are on a short leash. The VAB, uh, we are accountable, and I think that Canadians must be able to count on us as bit of having a credit in integrity and we are very closely watched by the Ombudsman such that uh, each and every evening on all platforms we have quality programming that's diverse and credible and that's what uh, gives us the edge uh, over other media outlets. Uh, there's no Ombudsman uh, monitoring private uh, te television channels and for TV viewers, for the uh, listeners of uh, Radio Canada, it's very re reassuring to know that journalists and producers and reporters uh, are being monitored by the Ombudsman and that we have to be accountable under our journalistic norms and standards. So it's very, very much indeed possible for Radio Canada CBC to engage in good independent uh, journalism. Well, the other night on The National, we had Prince Harry was in town and Meghan Markle and he were holding hands for the first time and we were thinking, that doesn't belong in the news, but maybe it does belong in the news. And, and every day there's a different Trump story. How do you decide whether those are the questions to, to deal with every night? When, when we first came under so much criticism for journalism in general for missing how Donald Trump became president. We had all these debates in the newsroom about, you know, where did we go wrong? We started interviewing people that we would never have put on the air before, like Ann Coulter and even a, a fellow who was working for the Kelly Leach campaign. And we basically just gave them the airwaves. Was that the right? Like, it's, so it's not, it's not easy. We have difficult decisions to make all the time. And, but as you say, we're, we have a lot more rules at CBC, but uh, we have another question from, I'm not sure, but from uh, Florence. Oui, une question d'un inter... Yes, a uh, question for Christine Latré. 
What is the concrete initiatives that CBC Radio Canada uh, is undertaking to counter fake news? Well, I'd like to give you a very concrete example that we experienced during the spring floods that occurred uh, in many places, particularly in Ontario and Quebec, in the Outaouais region, eastern Ontario, which were some of the most affected areas. When you think about fake news, one has the sense that, uh, you know, there might be a photo that might go viral without too many ramifications. For example, we saw in a newspaper a photo of a huge fish that uh, seemed to be floating in, along the streets of Gatineau. And of it turned out to be fake news, and those folks that shared it have, didn't have a conscience. No one died from that fake news, but on the same day, we got uh, what seemed to be credible news that there was a Hydro-Quebec dam that had collapsed close to here and that was going to flood municipalities that already were flooded. And it took about an hour or two to be able to verify that news and vet those sources to people out on the ground who would tell us what was actually happening. And in the meantime, media outlets shared that news. So did Canadians. You can imagine the panic for those who already had water in their basements and they heard that there was a, uh, a dam that had just uh, collapsed. So it's incumbent upon us uh, on a daily basis to ensure that the information that we put out there is verified, uh, true, and we continue to do this. And I think that's the way we should set ourselves apart. Do you want to add something to that? Uh, yes. In Radio Canada CBC, we already have uh, well established mechanisms to counter fake news. Our news is verified, corroborated. We double verify it with two sources. And in our newsrooms, we are equipped to deal with fake news. Well, I think we need to put things in context. Fake news uh, didn't just fall out of the sky uh, yesterday. There was uh, an interview of uh, Fidel Castro from 20 years ago. It was a, as a, it was a and it was created a scandal, and we saw in the Washington Post. And we have a president in the U.S. at the moment that is waging war against media outlets, uh, uh, legacy and traditional media outlets. And we need to, on a daily basis, uh, uh, in fact, uh, set the record straight, because we are trying to correct Trump's fake news. Exactly. So it's not our role at Radio Canada. So it's not our role to criticize uh, politicians at Radio Canada CBC or people who hold uh, public office. However, Mr. Trump has put a huge focus on fake news, but I can reassure you there's no fake news coming out of Radio Canada, CBC, and I haven't seen any in recent years. We'll come back to that later, but Mr. Trump now has an opportunity to sidestep the media and speak directly through Twitter, and it's becoming harder and harder to combat that. Another question. If you thought by moderating this panel you get out of being asked a question, <laughs> Fareed here has other uh, no intentions. Comment. No comment. No comment, so no. What is your question, Fareed? Um, I'd like to know the process that that the uh, journalists go through to determine what makes it to the top of the, sto uh, top of the story list. And I'll, I'll give you an example. The Rohingya story is suddenly all over media, and yet this is not a new story. It's been going on for years, and yet the media has never covered it to uh, any great extent, but now it is. And so what decisions are made to get uh, those stories on the top of the uh, story list? Especially online in, in the order they appear. Yes. Exactly. yes. Wendy? Yeah, it's really, really difficult. There is no magic rule. Some of it depends on the people who are participating and making the decision. So we have conference calls that start first thing in the morning uh, where the senior editors, including the anchor, is sort of saying more of this, less of that, and then we go off and the journalists figure out what they're doing and filing on and so on. The Our lineups have changed so much lately because what is the bigger story? Uh, the, as you say, the Rohingya crisis has been going on for decades millennia, I don't know, but certainly. Um, but now it's because there has been accusations, public accusations by uh, United Nations and even our own government of ethnic cleansing, and you have uh, tens of thousands of people, maybe even half a million people arriving on the border, uh, that it becomes a much, a much bigger story. There's so much to cover in the world, and obviously we do obsess, we do pay more attention to the stories that are closer to home and where we actually have pictures and can interview people. All of these things make a decision and what you were talking about of Trump, how much Trump, how much do we cover? We had massive debates about that over and over and uh, is, is it just sensational or is the world actually changing? So it's, these are debates uh, 
and ultimately somebody makes a decision and it's not always the right one. Je pense que le panel va être d'accord avec l'essentiel de cette I think the panel will agree with the pith of that response. You have another question, a question regarding the Chemin des Experts. My name I have a question and I am a Canadian citizen and I didn't have an opportunity to grow in my country of origin, but I'm aware of what's happening in Burundi. Since 2015, Radio Canada CBC has been broadcasting news which does, in fact, misrepresent what's happening in my country. And what concerns me is sometimes you choose quote-unquote specialists who compare Burundi, the current Burundi and Rwanda from uh, 1974. And I think it's a way of trivializing genocide. And I want, what I'd like to know is that is there a way of uh, vetting real experts rather than people who aren't well versed in these issues? Votre question. Thank you very much for your question. I don't know if Christian wants to add anything, but what we can say in response is that oftentimes we are caught up in a tornado of uh, news, and it's tough, particularly when. Uh, uh, it's a, a question of very remote and far away countries, and it's hard to, do, to uh, sift between the truth and lies. Recently, I received a, a video from a Facebook friend with a uh, dis disgraceful, awful uh, video of what happens uh, in uh, uh, the Congo. And it's even more difficult because it's hard to get out into the field to verify the facts, to analyze them, and to find local people to uh, put us uh, on the right track. Because sometimes there might be someone else who's better versed uh, to set the record straight. And I don't think that there's a per any perfect answer to your question. And it's a huge problem as journalists. We have a great deal of trouble covering accurately everything that happens uh, ac across the globe. We have correspondents in dangerous situations, such as Marie-Ève Bédard, among others. But you are right. and we are uh, constantly asking ourselves how we should ensure that we are covering as much as we can, uh, which is fact-based. Uh, thank you for the question. Move on to the next theme, and maybe I can come to you first, Chelsea, on, on that question. So our, we've uh, talked about credibility, a lot more to say, but our next discussion is about the public value and, and the role of CBC. So we'll have that in just a moment. <laughs> So, Charles, I'm going to start with you on, on this question. Um, I used to work on Marketplace, and I used to have to, like, people thought I was beating someone up because you'd get all of your information, and then you'd go and ask them these questions. But it was easier to do that because often you knew the answers to the questions because there'd be so much research that would have been done. So it was, it's like now if you're interviewing a politician or it's a new subject and you're trying to figure out what is the right approach, you can't be that forcible, but on Marketplace, you actually really hold people's feet to the fire. Tell us, tell us about that and, and what's, I guess, special about CBC Radio Canada that we can actually put the resources to that sort of thing. Um, Hubert touched on this a little bit, but I think really it's such an exciting, incredible time to be working in investigative journalism at CBC right now. And I think that's the case for a number of reasons, but most importantly, while so many investigative units are being closed down or shut down, we are growing. And we're seeing that shift, and it's really twofold. Um, you may not all know all of the details, but we are undergoing a huge reorganization uh, right now in the building, and one of the new pillars in our building is investigative journalism. And we have seen not only a reorganization, but also a reinvestment. So great example at Marketplace um, last year, real estate was on everybody's mind and still is. Um, we, through special funding, were able to go to Australia and shine a light on um, the way they do it somewhere else in the world. World. And as a result of the hidden camera investigation we did into real estate, um, Ontario right now is taking a look at real estate reform. And one of the things they're considering is banning double ending. Um, Shannon Martin in the new enterprise unit in Toronto Local took a look at what's wrong with renting in Toronto, something that so many people can so easily identify with. And a result, as a result of her series, you're seeing the Ontario government take a look at right now reforming rental 
legislation in this province. So um, it's very exciting because our resources, the things that we have access to at CBC are not things that everyone has access to. Um, we're working right now with um, a new unit of digital um, data journalists and you're going to see some of that work coming onto Marketplace, but it's fantastic to have those people and those skills. I took a data journalism course just a few weeks ago and, and the things that I've learned there I'm already putting into practice. So it's a very exciting time to be working in investigative and not just in current affairs. You're seeing that trickle down into all the local newsrooms as well. Christian, Melissa talked about uh, the ombudsman earlier, uh, proper frameworks and uh, journalistic integrity. There are a number of students behind us and some of my former students uh, here in the room and I'm sure that they'd be very interested uh, to hear what you have to say when you're a journalist and you get an assignment in the morning. We're not uh, just uh, left up to our own devices, we have a team to support us. Tell us about your daily experience uh, regarding uh, public values. On a daily basis, I'm really uh, caught up uh, in a whirlwind of news. I work on the morning LDE uh, news uh, program. And when you arrive in the morning, you have to be broadly uh, uh, aware of the uh, late-breaking news. But sometimes you're caught off guard. There's uh, news that uh, has just happened and broke. And there's a whole uh, uh, chain of command. There's the uh, head of the uh, uh, news program who and then when we get to our workplace we need to let our colleagues know what's happening because there are a lot of folks in the newsroom that rely on us. We're out there on the ground as reporters. We're the ears and the eyes of the team in the newsroom, whether it be the web team or the decision makers. So we have to tweet the information quickly and that's the way things are now. It's uh, something that we've had to adapt to. and. Also, we need to make sure all the folks in the newsroom are up to date on what's happening. And that's what I like in my vocation. We're really uh, in uh, at the very front, you know, on the front burner and seeing what's happening uh, on an everyday basis. And that's uh, <laughs> well, we do learn a lot on a daily basis. We have a question from Florence. It's a question for Christiane Atre. We have uh, someone asking on the web, with new technologies and the rapid transfer of information, how do foreign uh, correspondents uh, re remain relevant? Well, I think that uh, they are still relevant. Radio-Canada CBC is the only network to have foreign correspondents. Uh, uh, there is a huge... Uh, tsunami of uh, news on a daily basis, but nothing uh, can replace a reporter out in the ground who's telling a story, whether it be in the US, uh, in the uh, Near East, uh, in the Far East, uh, wherever. And, you know, we have an opportunity to meet people out on the ground and then come back to our offices and uh, put together a story to tell Canadians. And this uh, lets the public, uh, gives them a window into what is actually happening in the world. So I don't even question that. I think that, you know, you've got Twitter and Facebook, uh, you can name it. But I think that uh, foreign correspondents are very relevant and Radio Canada excels. Respondents come to Toronto or to Montreal or to Ottawa and we have this reunion and it sounds really sucky, but my heart just swells. I just get so proud of, because you can get mad at your employer or your colleagues, but you see from time to time anywhere. But you see these people in this room and the way that they speak about how they fight for stories and how they fight for a budget and how we just had an ally uh, with the Rohingya on the border of Myanmar and uh, uh, and Bangladesh. And so you can see, we all get so used to seeing bits and pieces of pictures on, on social media these days. And, and it's wonderful that we are, we do have eyes on the world, but having our foreign correspondents there, unlike any other network in Canada, mm -hmm. is, is pretty spectacular. We're going to go to the, back to the floor again in a moment, but Wab, I just wanted to come to you on the whole idea of the public value. One of the things that CBC has really tried to do, particularly in the last five years, is to have a more credible voice among the uh, the indigenous community. Tell us, tell us about that. Yeah, I think for a long time, um, uh, many indigenous communities uh, across Canada haven't really trusted 
CBC or other mainstream media outlets because they haven't seen themselves effectively represented, whether it be within the stories or um, in the newsroom themselves or on the screens or on, on the airwaves with actual Indigenous journalists doing the work. Uh, and when I was growing up um, in a Anishinaabe community on Georgian Bay, uh, we would pull in the national uh, with the rabbit ears and I would never see any Indigenous journalists on CBC or our stories re reflected with the adequate context to really get to the root of what some of the real Indigenous issues are in Canada. But fortunately, um, as, as Hubert mentioned earlier, uh, CBC Indigenous has been um, a really great um, sort of creation in that it's a hub for a lot of the original journalism that we do at CBC to highlight Indigenous issues and to really reflect in Indigenous communities. And there are other initiatives like CBC Unreserved. Over the years, there's also been CBC's Eighth Fire, uh, Revision Quest, the radio show. So um, by really getting out into those communities and, and reflecting them in proper ways, I think we're finally starting to build that trust and we're filling those awareness gaps that were left by the education system, essentially. So um, that's not to say that CBC can totally make up for some of those gaps left by you know, elementary and secondary school experiences, but we can offer that context that a lot of Canadians have missed out on. So we have a really good opportunity right now, I believe. Merci pour la réponse. Giacomo, une autre question. Thanks for your response. Giacomo, another question. Uh, in a time when we have so many online review tools of companies and comment sections, what's the value in your mind of a marketplace for, for helping people and guiding people? So it's a, it's a great question and um, you would, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. Right? I mean, people are weighing in now in more ways than ever before. And I think what's interesting is, is it's actually, in a strange way, um, helping us because it is so transparent. People now have opinions and they are not afraid to share them. So it's really actually, um, in some ways, helped us do our journalism because there are a lot more ways and tools and resources for us to reach out to people who before may not have had a place to share an opinion on something or provide insight or share an experience. Um, and so I think it's actually one of the new tools that we have um, and of course there are things to be careful of and leery of, but it's actually opened up um, a huge area of opportunity for us, in particular at Marketplace, because we really do want to hear from consumers. And Wendy and I were talking about this earlier, but you're starting to see a lot more transparency and authenticity in our shows. You know, if you if you saw the episode that Wendy did last year, you know, she's in the car, she's taking you on your journey. You're gonna see that in our show on Friday night. So I think you're also starting to see some of that transparency in the way we're telling our stories, which is great. And, um, you know, the flip side of the online reviews is that you're also starting to see us investigate how companies are using those reviews and educate the public on the things that you need to watch for. So it's definitely a double-edged sword, but it's, um, it's, a new, it's a new chapter for us, and um, it's definitely been worthwhile exploring, I think. Alors voilà pour ce thème, uh, valeur publique. There we have it, uh, public values. Let's move on to the next theme, the third of the day. So we're here to talk about little thing called democracy. Um, so Christian, we're going to start with you on this one. Tu peux me répondre en français, comme tu veux. There's a lot of people who talk about uh, political satire, which is known in French as la satire politique. Um, and it started perhaps with John Stewart, and now there's John Oliver, there's all the rest of them. So uh, is that a good thing? Does that mean that we've lost trust that people, that young people are, are turning to other audiences, to comedians instead of journalists? Is it a good thing? Does it challenge us? I'm just what impact do you see it having? But I think it allows us, especially in the States, to, to vent, you know, because a lot of people in the United States are actually uh, uh, stressed by that presidency, you know, and we saw like uh, uh, the satire show uh, Saturday Night Live, picturing Trump as a little bit cuckoo, you know, and his uh, strategist in chief uh, Bannon uh, like the, the 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 other cuckoo. So uh, no, I think it's it, it's helpful and it's uh, it doesn't you know we but we we saw some things like also Kitty uh, uh, Griffin with uh, that that the, mask, you know, the head so, of Trump, yeah, bloody head of yeah, Trump, yeah, that was yeah. bleeding. So uh, that was not as uh, funny. But uh, does that uh, make it a all different uh, different challenge for journalists? 
Well, I think we you know, can live with that. We've always lived with political satire. It's always been around, whether in the US or in Canada or in France even. So we've seen it uh, worldwide. And I think it's crucial in a society to be able to laugh at ourselves, particularly in the US uh, currently. Americans need to be, have an opportunity to laugh about themselves. And it's very palpable, this uh, need to have comedians and artists and who are, in fact, uh, making a mockery of what's happening in the White House. And I think that's what's at the very heart of democracy. Yes, to have a good report on Trump, but also a comedy that makes a laughing stock of Donald Trump. So there's also the Flack, which is a program we have. It's healthy. Yes, there's the Flack. It's not uh, satire, it's more um, humour. But we all have, so have the Soirée est encore tout jeune, the evening still young, that has uh, a very young viewership uh, and which, uh, six, with, through humour, is able to cut through what's happening in the news and uh, turn it on its head. And people are interested in the news, but sometimes we have to look at the way we present the news and think about the tone. Traditionally, journalists, in order to stress how relevant it is, uh, are very cerebral. And in Radio Canada, you know, there's a typical way of dressing, a typical way of speaking to our viewers. But nowadays, and we spoke about this earlier, we look at our smartphones. Before, there was just television and friends and the newspaper. But now we have our smartphones, and everything uh, comes together in smartphones and we're fed from different sources and as journalists uh, we uh, have to compete with Snapchat that uh, folks uh, send each other, Instagram, uh, YouTube. So can we maintain our credibility, our journalistic rigour? Well, perhaps we can uh, modify our tone, our way of framing the news and presenting it so that uh, we can remain relevant to Canadians and to the public, and in this particular case, to Canadian youth. And I think the popularity of satirical and programs and uh, is part of that. We have to treat ourselves a little less seriously. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Step and down. We have a question, oui. I think, from uh, Florence. Florence. Oui, une question pour Mathieu Nadeau. Il inter... Question for Mathieu Nadeau. The market pressures are reducing the budgets for newsrooms. There are fewer and fewer journalists to cover the news. Is this having direct ramifications on uh, maintaining a sound democracy? Well, the short answer is yes. It's really sad for us who work in the media to see what's happening to all grassroots and other organisations that, for financial reasons, have to make cutbacks to newsrooms, reduce the number of newspapers they print, their print run, etc. And I am privileged, and I have to pinch myself every day and say, hey, you work at Radio Canada CBC, and we're so lucky to have teams across the world and domestically. We have newsrooms. You can see us uh, on the television, but there are a whole host of folks working behind the scenes. And in Radio Canada, we have to face the same challenges. We're facing the same transformation, but we're supported by strong teams that are really pitch in and help us do our job. And it's a real privilege. Thank you, Mathieu. A question, Jacques. Charles C., how do journalists uphold their public service to the people when a, when a growing populist of audience uh, tunes out more and more? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's tough, right? There's a lot of noise out there, and I think that um, we have a very big responsibility as journalists with the public broadcaster to continue to remain objective, to work so hard to continue to tell stories that not only reflect Canadians, but that Canadians are truly interested in. And so I think one of the ways that we're all trying to do that, to, to remain relevant, is is to continue to turn to people and hear from people. Um, you know, I, I can speak to my experience at Marketplace in particular because so many of our story ideas come from viewers. And we're really fortunate that we have an audience that continues to turn to us. And I think it's it's a very um, important responsibility because, like Wendy said, we do knock on the doors. We are holding people accountable. And I think that that is more important than ever. I have something to add. You know, on prédit, on prédit la mort <coughs> des pièces. Well, 
we've been predicting the demise of uh, uh, TV news for a decade, and we can see that ratings are still great, and uh, people come back uh, again and again to see us, and they visit our uh, multiple platforms. There are hundreds of thousands of people that get their news from our platforms, and we're still relevant. People still have confidence in us, despite all the background noise and the, multiple, the plethora of uh, sources. And I think it's extraordinary that this uh, demise was predicted, but it has never happened, and it's a miracle that we're still on the airwaves and still so relevant. Uh, news is still uh, broadcast live. We, the first 15 minutes, and, and uh, videos are the most popular medium, especially on Facebook. So people like to see the news broadcast by people they perceive to be credible. A question for Miss Elisa uh, Francois. Do we need a distinctive Canadian voice, and if so, why? Absolutely, we need a Canadian voice that sets us apart, because we need to talk about issues that set us apart and that are of interest to us. And I think that's the strength of my employer, that is to be interested in uh, these issues and uh, the cultural scene that uh, is very much homegrown in this whole sea of information. But what's in of interest to us as Canadians? What uh, issues affect us and uh, are uh, food for thought for us? And Radio-Canada CBC does a great job of that. Shani, Mathieu. Mathieu, earlier I wanted to ask, uh, we spoke about democracy. In the evening news, and you know, aside from uh, Facebook uh, posts, what do people do on their smartphones? Well, I'd just like to tack on to what Olivier said earlier. We are reinventing the wheel of platforms uh, in order to, uh, in fact, to keep our audience. And uh, it's almost as if they were right there with us. Uh, and it's almost palpable how we can uh, almost touch them. And in Quebec, uh, we're uh, on the, the eve of uh, municipal elections, and uh, Radio-Canada Gatineau is a partner with the uh, Youth uh, Commission of Gatineau. And some of them aren't even at eligible voting age, these young Canadians. Uh, but we're asking them what's important to them. You know, in our newsrooms, we think we have to talk about public transit and tax reform. But young people will be with us over the upcoming weeks. They're going to do reports on our channel. And it's really stimulating and rewarding. And it's completely changed the way we produce the news. So, Another example, there was a public transit strike here in, sp in the spring. We decided to try and target uh, folks who didn't, couldn't take a bus and were left stranded and to uh, interact with them on Facebook and some folks who worked here at the University of Ottawa. Uh, they were able to get their attention and then they were interested in our 6 p.m. Uh, news broadcasts and radio broadcasts. I'm not that old, but I have a whole lot of young folks around me who have really exciting ideas, and it's really stimulating. We're going to go to one last question, uh, and then we'll move on. Uh, Jack Yes, this one is for Wob. Why does the media give airtime to stories that oppose our democratic values and system? By doing so, aren't you validating their cause? Wow. <laughs> I guess that's uh, fitting for a university setting here, right? Very uh, academic question. Um, yeah, th those are debates that we get caught up in. Wendy talked about this earlier, you know, who we decide we're going to put on and why and to, you know, what, what value that is and what service, uh, what it serves. Um, but I think it's important to remember that uh, as journalists, is it's not just about putting on the other side of the story, right? Um, we have to consider a multiple sides, multiple points of view, and uh, we only have so much air time, and sadly, um, that's how we're perceived sometimes, right? By just putting on something that may be uh, um, poor taste or uh, that opposes democratic values, as, as you mentioned. Um, but 
in that sense, we're accountable to the viewer and to the listener and to the reader. And uh, you've seen some examples over the past few months of, of CBC being taken to task for putting certain individuals or organizations on the air, and, and rightfully so. People take issue with that, and that's the only way we can learn, really, and that's why this is a discussion. That's why we are on the receiving end, especially in social media, um, to, to hear these things, because it is very much a learning process, especially in the digital age. So uh, yeah, they're, they're just parts of the discussions that we have at an, on an editorial level, and um, we're still learning, and we want to learn from, from all of you, really. So we have just a few more minutes. I think mm -hmm. the idea is to try and take a few questions from the from the floor. If anyone wants to just put up your hand, we Alors, can si pass the uh, mic around. Mm -hmm. si des questions à poser dans la salle, peu... If any of you have questions to ask in the room, where regardless of where you are, just uh, wave and we'll hand you a microphone. You can see there's a number of students, a number of uh, teachers, professors. Uh, uh, now, now's the time. And we'll uh, and try and answer, panelists will try and answer your questions in the uh, next couple of minutes. Elise? Go ahead. We have a question. So my question is, uh, I'm a professor here at the University of Ottawa in the communication department, and hardly any of my students have cable television. So I'm wondering, in an age of cord cutting, shouldn't CBC's uh, news network, the cable TV, be offered and streamed free uh, online to engage young, a younger audience? What do you think about that? I don't think anyone in the front row has ever heard that question before. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know whether anyone wants to volunteer for that. I'm certainly not going to make that. Uh, uh, yeah, I wouldn't mind. Yeah. I think the person best to place to answer that question is Hubert. Hubert. <laughs> Let me take a crack at it. The platforms and the relationships that we have with the broadcasters. Uh, Some things we're able to do, others we're not. Obviously, we have an agreement with a cable broadcaster that is that our signal be piggybacked onto its network and the various channels that uh, it's able to offer. But of course, that uh, uh, is a bit of a conflict between our relationship with the cable broadcaster and our own initiatives. Heather Conway? I mean, I think you can, uh, sorry, I'm the head and of can, CBC, Heather Conway, and I think you can get a pretty good, I think you can get uh, a pretty good feel for uh, and uh, access to an enormous amount of content through cbc.ca slash news. Um, you know, it's, uh, it is the most successful digital news uh, app in the country for a reason. It has an enormous volume of uh, regularly updated news content. And you have seen us um, now on Facebook um, with the National. You've seen us on Facebook avec uh, uh, nos émissions d'information en français. Alors, with our French language news programs. So increasingly, this content's becoming available. And uh, it's kickstarting a, a new discussion with radio or with cable bro broadcasters. So it's a tough question and a tough question to answer. That's another question from the floor. Go ahead. My question is, how can you ensure that your stories reflect the diversity of a broad, wide variety of Canadians, including those um, who are racialized, women, LGBT Canadians, and then also, of course, people from both rural and urban backgrounds? That is a huge question. I mean, that's basically what the question we've been asking ourselves since the very beginning of this, uh, since the beginning of news. Uh, and it does keep changing. Um, am I being told to go to... Uh, this is questions for Heather. So sorry, I was going to try and answer it all for you. There you go, Heather. Mm -hmm. Heather Conway is head of uh, CBC, VP of what are you? I'm executive. <laughs> <laughs> She's the big boss of English TV. Oh. Such enormous respect for my journalists. <laughs> Uh, just for the record, I'm the executive vice president oh. of uh, CBC. Um, obviously, representation and reflection of our communities is deeply important to us uh, across all of our services, not just in the news service, in the entertainment programming, in our radio programming, in our digital uh, choices, and we work hard to do that every day. As Wab said, you know, Jennifer McGuire, who's here, who's our head of news, started the Aboriginal uh, portal. Um, about five years ago, maybe longer. 
um, to do just that. Uh, we have internally uh, started a bunch of uh, different employee resource groups uh, who represent different voices inside our organization. Um, I am the executive sponsor of the LGBT one, LGBTQ, uh, I am L, and so I'm very aware of what the experience is to come from a marginalized community uh, and to ensure that voices are heard. Um, I think it's uh, really uh, a very practical question on many levels. It's not a philosophical one. We are Canada and Canada is us. We reflect our communities. We represent our communities. And we do that with on-air personalities. We do that through editorial meetings where we say, is this the angle we want on this story? Are we getting the right voices? Are we hearing from the right people? It's a constant daily exercise. Merci, uh, Madame Exec Executive Vice President. Something to that. It also starts from where we hire people in the top ranks of the organization and leadership positions. Because you cannot have these issues discussed unless at the top levels, and as we grow as a corporation, we have these people in, in, in important positions. They will influence the subject matters and they will open up the conversations to even more. So, as Heather said, in the newsrooms, in our story meetings, but also in the management and the governance of CBC Radio Canada, you will see that. And just, I mean, just the senior executive team of CBC Radio Canada reports to me. I have eight direct reports. I have six women, two men. Um, I didn't look for them uh, in ratios. I just hired the best possible people for those jobs. And uh, as Heather said, I mean, sorry, four of these people take the box of LBGT again. It's not because we look for them, it's simply a realization that this is the best people we can find for the jobs we need and allows the explosion of conversations around these subject matters much easily. Obviously uh, an ongoing debate. When I was uh, working in the Ottawa Bureau 100 years ago, I was the first woman to cover the Prime Minister for the National. There used to be pictures of naked women on the walls, which showed how much power women had in those days in that Bureau. Uh, now, I think the women's issue is, uh, we've, we've kind of done pretty well, but it's got to become broader than that, and there's a lot of pressure to do so, which is good. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Florence, you have a question. Oui, une question qui s'adresse à tous les panélistes. Question for all the panelists. What uh, advice, or recommendations would you give to students, uh, young people starting their studies and careers as uh, journalists? Well, Mathieu, you say that you uh, uh, have uh, more and more young people you're involved with, so the floor is yours. Well, my advice would be to develop your intellectual curiosity and be interested in what's happening uh, everywhere around the world and I think it's one of the top qualities of most of my colleagues here they're curious and they're engaged and interested and we all enjoy our vocation because we love the public we like to be in close contact with the public so if you love people you like to tell stories you'll love journalism and we're waiting for you to come on board Melissa and then Charles if I could just add question everything that you hear very straightforward uh, rule of thumb. Even if it seems obvious to you, ask yourself uh, questions about what seems obvious, because questions are worthwhile because oftentimes the truth is hidden under the uh, questions. We live in a really big, beautiful, wonderful country. Don't be afraid to move to different corners of this vast space. You are only going to be a better journalist the more experiences and the more places that you have. Um, you know, I can honestly say that my experience working in BC, Alberta, Ontario has, has given me perspective. And I would also say that in particular, I think it's relevant today, critical thinking. Um, you, you touched on it there, but it's not enough to just be curious. When someone gives you an answer, ask, why? Why are you telling me that? Where did that come from? How, how come that is the case? And don't stop with just a simple um, response, because it is really about cultivating your curiosity. And I think when we're talking about reputation and credibility, that is huge. And I don't think enough of us are thinking critically um, every day. Olivier? 
Olivier, go on, Christian. Go on, you go first. Well, we have to be there uh, for the right reasons. We're not there to be uh, in the spotlight in front of the cameras. It's not a glamorous uh, profession, being a journalist. We're there to serve the best interests of the public, first and foremost. We're there because we care about society, living together as a society, and we want to improve it. We may come across as negative uh, sometimes because we put our fingers on things that aren't working, but we want to hold to account uh, the culprits. Uh, that's... Uh, and the whole goal is to improve our society and to live well, better together. Well, it's a, pas it's a passion for me. It's an extraordinary vocation. It's absolutely crucial. I've been done 10 years of investigative journalism before I came to, got, came to Washington. Many of our investigative journalism in Canada really changed things in society. And I think journalism can really affect change. Um, especially among, uh, you know, uh, public officials. It's, we are the watchdogs, it's your money. Uh, you're the ones actually pulling the purse, holding the purse strings at the end of the day, and we're there to hold them to account. We're there to hold to account those people who are, uh, hold the purse strings. Before we come for the final question... ...you give to a young person that would like to become eventually a journalist. Well, I think uh, storytelling really is the backbone of any culture, and it's really what binds cultures together. And here in Canada, uh, we run the gamut of diverse communities. And I think as long as you're passionate about stories and about reflecting people's experiences, um, you'll go a long way. Um, you have to be curious, and you have to really listen. Uh, you have to be a storyteller and not a story taker in, in many senses. So uh, that's what I try to impart uh, on, I think anybody can become a journalist. Uh, just as long as you're passionate about that and you hold those those core values uh, deep inside you. Dernière question de la salle avec Florence. Final question from the room, Florence. A question on the Francophone Acadian communities. If you could just ask a short question, madam. You said you wanted to reflect uh, the reality of what's happening in Canada, but what about the place that you uh, give to Francophones outside Quebec? Well, that's a good question for Mathieu because the uh, news uh, bridges uh, the border between Ontario and Quebec and we have a very diverse uh, viewership. Well, indeed, it's part of, it's among our daily concerns. Wendy referred earlier to what happens on a daily basis uh, and Martin spoke about our story meetings uh, and we're there to uh, ensure my team and myself that we are targeting the hot button issues for each of these communities. It's not always easy because sometimes we speak a lot, talk a lot about Quebec because there's a lot that's happening there. And sometimes we talk more, a lot about uh, Ontario. Sometimes I get uh, emails that say, oh, I think you've, you spoke too much about Quebec. And then the very next day you've spoken too much about Ontario. I think that's a sign that we do our doing a good job. And Yesterday was the uh, Francophone Ontarians uh, Day and we celebrated it and we very much care about our Franco-Ontarians uh, and Francophones outside Quebec. And Now, generally, if we could just pass the mic to Mr Bissonnet so he can respond to this answer. Mr Bissonnet is responsible for Francophone CBC. Well, just to add to that response, uh, we have... Uh, about 20 francophone uh, newsrooms, so there are at least 20 uh, broadcasts, uh, one in Vancouver, one on Moncton, in all the metropolises where there's francophone populations, and same in the late afternoon at 6pm in each of those uh, locations, and we ensure that in national scheduling and programming, we make sure that there are correspondents uh, that uh, come from across Canada, and the role of, uh, of Radio Canada is so that francophones can live in French in Canada. It's not just a responsibility for us, it's a privilege so that francophones can live in French through our channel. Thank you, Mr. Bissonnet. Well, we have a little bit of time left over, so let's uh, take a final question from the room. We have a, a woman who's uh, with my colleague Florence there. Go ahead. Well, my question is uh, 
for anyone who wants to answer it, in fact. We spoke a lot about uh, the importance of being out in the field when there are major events breaking. However, sometimes there are no journalists or correspondents available on, out in the field. So what do you do at that point? Do you call on freelancers and how does it, that all play out? Merci beaucoup, collègue. Thank you very much for the question. Christian, are you ready to answer that question? Well, as Mathieu said earlier, there's a whole process involved. Uh, and these are decisions that are taken in the morning. Uh, the uh, head chief producers determine whether it's worthwhile to send folks out into the field. Sometimes things are in a remote, uh, inaccessible uh, region. Uh, and, you know, fr we, we uh, will use France 2 uh, as programming. It doesn't happen much, very often, but sometimes. So that speaks to the relevance of the news and depends on that. Well, with the Irma hurricane, I thought about you a couple of weeks ago, and I think that you contributed uh, very, very much, uh, and we, RDI, played a huge role given how important that news was. And I think that we do have enough resources to deploy enough of our team players out into the field, as we saw in Florida in recent weeks. Just give me give you an example, concrete uh, example. We were just discussing a, a poss possibility, and my boss is looking at me in, right in the eyes, but maybe we might send a correspondent to Puerto Rico, but it's up to the management of Radio Canada in Puerto Rico. Uh, the whole population is cut off from the rest of the world, and uh, they're very close to my region in the U.S. We're taking a very serious look at uh, what we might do. I just want to thank you all for the questions and for your contributions. It's been quite something. I, I know when I started out in this business, there was a lot of technology. You had the whole day. You had lots of resources. And now everything is so fast. Olivier, you talked about, about how people are getting their information. And we all know that the way we get information has changed so much. So I don't know whether to be to feel that I'm lucky to be so old and have had it the old way, or, or to be jealous. I think it's, it's both. It's fantastic, and CBC is in the middle of it. And it's, uh, so thank you so much for coming and, and sharing both our, our pride in working for CBC and, and the challenges that we know that we that we have to face in terms of democracy, credibility, and, and the role of public broadcasting. What I'd add is, of course, when it comes to journalism, it's an important uh, part of democracy. We, this is a uh, annual public meeting. It's a democratic exercise. We gave you an opportunity to ask your own questions, and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our six panelists that I'd like us to warmly uh, thank. Évidemment aussi à vous. And thanks to everyone in the room. Thanks for having come here today, for your attention. Also, thanks for your questions. Thanks to Giacomo. Thanks to Florence. And of course, thanks to all our viewers uh, listening and all those listening online. That we want to, because we, we don't just do news, obviously. There is Le Telejournal and The National and all the fabulous programs on radio. But CBC does other things as well. And so we want now to uh, thank you for all of your contributions. And we're going to go on to introduce you to uh, a completely different cast. So, uh, with us today are cast members from Kim's Convenience, which is Canada's number one comedy. Kim's Convenience, they had an amazing first year, and uh, they're back this year. They're nominated for an astounding 11, mm -hmm. hi, uh, Canadian Screen Award. So, here we go. <laughs> Andrea Bank, Simu Lu, Jean Yu. <coughs> And Paul Sunyum. Hi. Hi, how oh, are you? Oh, so nice to meet you. Yeah, take it away. It's lovely to be here. Thank you so much, everybody. We are honored to be here at University of Ottawa. It's, this is exciting. We, uh, university was one of the most exciting times of my life. Uh, I learned a lot. I got a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge. So I hope I wish you guys the best. You've caught us now. We're in the middle of a cross-Canada publicity tour for Kim's Convenience. Uh, we're in Ottawa tonight at the Bronson Centre at seven, uh, 8 o'clock p.m., where we're going to be screening the first two episodes of season two of Kim's Convenience. And you're all invited. So 
if you want to come join us, find our friends Carolyn or Jonathan. Where are they? Just raise your hands. Carolyn's over there. Give them your names, and they'll make sure that you guys get in. Also, if you choose not to come tonight, that's okay. We won't take it personally. As long as you go home and turn on CBC at 9 o'clock <laughs> and watch our premiere episode tonight. And okay. then the National at 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> or Le Telejournal. Yeah. Thank so thank you very much. Thank you so much. So our event is over, but we don't want you all to leave. There is a hall in the back if you would like to come and get an ego portrait, I think we're supposed to call that. Uh, uh, take a selfie with, uh, with anyone, take some pictures, have a glass of water, because that's all we can afford. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming uh, to contribute with us. Well, that uh, is uh, the end of our uh, show. Thank you very much to everyone at home, online, in the room. Thanks very much for your uh, participation. So that uh, brings to an end our annual public meeting. Thanks to everyone who took the trouble to come here to the University of Ottawa. Thanks to everyone who's followed us uh, online and streaming and on Facebook. This uh, meeting will be archived on uh, our website of CBC Radio Canada. Here at the University of Ottawa and also all of you online, it's been a pleasure asking your questions to this wonderful panel. Thank you for joining us for this annual public meeting of CBC Radio Canada. And if you joined halfway, you'd like to rewatch the whole thing, it is going to be archived. You can visit the website cbc.radio-canada.ca slash amp. Thank you very much. Merci.